welcome to the New Haven Museum. I'm Margaret Ann Tomaszewski, Executive Director. It's an honor to welcome you to today's program. Laurel Block, pioneering Holocaust filmmaker. The second annual Judith Ann Schiff Women's History Program. The museum is a vibrant center for exploring the people, places, events, and ideas that have shaped and continue to define the Elm City and highlighting women's achievements, not just during March, but year-round has been a focus of our work. As we look for ways to engage women as artists, guest curators, designers, and collaborators, give voice to their stories and lived experiences, and seek greater representation of women in our collections. Last year's inaugural talk was presented in connection with an exhibit then on view in this auditorium, Trailblazer, Connecticut Jewish Women Making History, from the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford, and Elizabeth Rose is with us again today. Um, and Ed followed other recent exhibits and programs centering women, from the artist of the New Haven Paint and Clay Club, to the work must be done, women of color and the right to vote, to instance Linda Lindros, Polaroid portraits, and currently on view is profiles Ruth McIntosh Coxwell and Dorothy Coxwell. They were um, mother and daughter artists who were at the forefront of the New Haven art scene in the early 20th century. And of course, we have shining light on truth, New Haven Yellow Slavery from the Beinecke Library, which highlights in the reading room of the 1831 college that could have been the academic and professional achievements of women despite incredible odds. Our Whitney Library holds a number of collections from women's organizations and women's papers to which we are now adding personal papers of Judy Shep, who was city historian and chief, ar chief archivist at Yale and a trailblazer in her own way. Judy was a longtime member of the museum's board. She served as its secretary. She was also a guest curator and a speaker. She was a generous friend, supportive of our staff, our go-to source for local history, and always a phone call away. I'm delighted to introduce Michael Dumenstein, president of the Jewish Historical Society of Greater New Haven. We are grateful to the Historical Society for this partnership, and in particular, I'd like to thank to their archivist, Jacob Rosenberger, for the tribute exhibit on Laurel Block that's downstairs in the lobby, and welcome their new archivist, Nicole, who's with us today, too. We'll have time at the end for questions, and present, uh, uh, after the presentations, and then we have refreshments. So, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the second annual Judith Ann Schiff Women's History Program. I'm the president of the Jewish Historical Society, as Margaret Ann said, and on behalf of our organization, we're delighted today to co sponsor today's program at the New Museum. Judith Schiff, for whom this annual program is named, was the founder of the Jewish Historical Society, as well as the Ethnic Heritage Center, of which we are one of five groups maintaining local ethnic historical archives. During Judy Schiff's extraordinary career, she served as Yale University's chief research archivist at the Sterling Memorial Library for more than a half century. Judy was the recipient of many honors. These included being named the New Haven City Historian, receiving the 2020 Yale Medal, becoming the first recipient of the Edward Boucher Legacy Award, and being named the director of the Harvey and Ellen Layton Archives at the Jewish Historical Society. What distinguished Judy Schiff was her unshakable commitment to uncovering, preserving, and ensuring historically accurate information in all of her research and writing. A few of Judy's family and friends who have helped us conceive this program are joining us here today, and I'd like to recognize Sarah Frame, Rachel Left, and Vera Wells, who worked with us to establish this program and whose presence here today is especially meaningful. Today we celebrate another daughter of the Elm City, Laurel Fox Block, who shared Judy Schiff's passion and quest for, in the contemporary vernacular, keeping it real. Laurel Block's more than three decades of radio and TV interviewing, documentary filmmaking, and pioneering work in obtaining, recording, and preserving the personal testimonies of witnesses to history's most horrific and tragic assault on humanity 
make her the perfect subject of this year's program. Today we'll hear from those who have studied and have been inspired by Laurel's work, as well as those who knew her professionally and personally. We're especially grateful to the members of Laurel's family, several of whom are joining us today. Special thanks to Sandra and Daniel Block, to Marion Fox Wexler, and to Gail Brecky, without whose support we could not have captured all that this program needed to accomplish. We're honored, and I'm sure Judith Schiff would be honored to know that our second annual Women's History Program is a tribute to Laurel Block. A few words of appreciation before we begin the program. I'd like to thank New Haven Museum Executive Director Margaret Ann Tokshevsky uh, and Director of Programs and Planning Cynthia Rikia for their exceptional partnership in the development, promotion, and presentation of today's event. Thank you to the Jewish Historical Society Board Member and Director of the Fortune of Video Archive for the Holocaust Testimony, Stephen Barron, for his contribution as heir to the work that Laurel Block began. Our thanks to Paul Falcone, Falcone of the University of New Haven's Communication, Film, and Media Studies Department for making available the collection of Laurel's, Laurel Block's televised interviews. The Jewish Historical Society is a grassroots organization that strives to compile, preserve, and share the rich history of Greater New Haven's Jewish community. We like to say that for the last 48 years, we've been preserving the past and the future. Several members of our volunteer board of directors have been fully engaged in the efforts to present today's program. Thanks to Rhoda Zoller Samuel and Marjorie Drucker, two past presidents, for their outstanding contributions. Thanks to the Jewish Historical Society's research archivist, Jacob Rick Rosenberger, for tying together the various video and archival pieces today, as well as for designing the visual display you may have passed in the main entrance of the, in the main entrance hall of the New Haven Museum. If you haven't yet seen it, uh, please be sure to take a moment to view this collection of memorabilia that chronicle Laurel Block's life and work. Our new archivist, Nicole Sador, is here today. Her first public assignment, covering for Jake, who is celebrating his 30th birthday today with him. And finally, but certainly not least, we have been truly blessed by the talents and efforts of writer and researcher Carol Bass, who has endeavored to capture the essence of why we pay tribute today to Laurel Block. <coughs> Carol has prepared an introduction to today's program, but will be resting her voice today, so I will at this time invite Rhoda Zoller Samuel to present Carol's message. Thank you and enjoy the program. Everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm sharing words that were written by Carol Bass, who is here. Carol, where are you? Stand up. Let everybody see Carol. Um, it's, it's truly an honor for me to be able to share Carol's words with you. Uh, Carol has been a volunteer with the Jewish Historical Society. She is a former journalist and an active member of the New Haven Jewish community. Carol wrote the biographical piece of that Laurel Block that you have today. In this introduction, Carol gives us an overview of Laurel's life and work. Other speakers today will delve more deeply into some aspects of that life and work, and you will have a chance to glimpse the variety of her extraordinary work. Laurel Block's block came from a family of doers, even so, her accomplishments stood out. Laurel was born in New Haven in 1926. Her father, John Fox, was a Hungarian immigrant who founded a successful steel company. Her mother, Rose Greenberg Fox, taught school, served in numerous civic organizations, and was reportedly the first woman to get a driver's license in New Haven. <laughs> Both parents worked tirelessly on behalf of Jewish communities in New Haven and around the world. Laurel's sister, Marion Fox Wexler, who we will hear from in a little while, 
is the kind of person who, when she moved to a town that didn't have a nursery school, she simply started one. And Laurel, well, Laurel was both visionary and the unstoppable worker behind the world's first video archive of Holocaust testimonies. Here are some highlights of her extraordinary work. She hosted an innovative educational radio show and an award-winning public affairs television program. She convened a group of women to start a TV station in Bridgeport, the first women-owned station in the country. She co-wrote a book on a subject entirely unrelated to her other projects. But Laurel Block is best known for her pioneering work in videotaping the memories of Holocaust survivors, and then collecting those tapes into what became the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. Along the way, she won an Emmy Award for a documentary about survivors. When she started this work, and the Emmy is in the display case downstairs, along with other things that uh, the family has given us to display for this program. When she started this work, other interviewers were recording survivors' memories on paper and audio cassette. Laurel took a different approach. She used video. Why is that so important? As host and producer of a TV interview show, Laurel said she understood, quote, the impact of the visual. She understood what she termed demeanor evidence, which conveys information and emotion that mere words cannot. The pain smile, the dabbing of a tear, the moment when <coughs> speech fails. Locke's work inspired many others to make similar recordings documenting survivors' accounts of atrocities around the world. Those include Steven Spielberg's USC Shoah Foundation, which now houses 56,000 interviews with Holocaust survivors, as well as video testimony projects documenting genocide and ethnic cleansing in Cambodia and the former Yugoslavia. And all that began with just four interviews recorded in 1979 in the New Haven office of Dory Lau, a psychiatrist and child Holocaust survivor. Today, the portion of video archive contains roughly 4,400 video interviews. In a few minutes, we'll see a video clip of Laurel speaking at a 1982 ceremony inaugurating the archive's move to Yale. I want to quote some of what she said because it explains both the urgency and the uncertainty that she brought to this project. Laurel said, I was sure of the impact of the visual. I was sure of the ability to do this kind of interviewing. I was sure that the technology was there to make it possible. And I was also sure, very frankly, that this was the time, that it was 40 years after the event and that time was indeed running out. What I was very uncertain about was opening old wounds, disturbing personal equilibrium. That's where Dory Love came in. He felt that the survivors, and he is a survivor, were sensing their own mortality and would be ready to come forward, Laurel said. How did Laurel come to this work? Growing up in New Haven in the 1930s, Laurel Fox and her sister, Marion, had already experienced anti-Semitism from bullies in their Beaver Hills neighborhood and kids at Roger Sherman School. Meanwhile, the Fox parents kept a close eye on the rise of the Nazis and what they were doing to German Jews. They made sure their young daughters understood as well. In 1937, Rose Fox took her girls on an extraordinary trip. In London, they visited Rose's older sister, and they saw a vicious anti-Semitic graffiti and witnessed the pro-Nazi ranting of fascist leader Oswald Mosley. In Brussels, Marion saw a sweet shop displaying a portrait of Hitler. And in Luxembourg, Rose's sister persuaded the family to walk across a bridge into Germany. They should see the beautiful countryside, she said. It was terrifying for the 11-year-old Laurel and Marion, just seven years old. The Nazis had been in power for four years. They had stripped German Jews of their citizenship and their civil rights. 
On the other side of the bridge, ferocious Nazi border guards held snarling German shepherds. As the family walked along a country road, German children stopped playing and gave the Heil Hitler salute. Back home, Rose and John tried to spread the word about what was happening to Jews in Europe, but no one believed them. They worked to promote a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And the sisters grew up attending Hill House High School, dating boys, going to college. Their father proudly sent them to Cornell University, insisting that they get an education so they could support themselves. Laurel married businessman Jay Block, known as Jim. She earned a master's degree from Queens College and worked as a teacher. Three children were born, Daniel, Michael, and Sandra. The family moved to Woodbridge. In 1964 came an unexpected opportunity. Yale had started an FM radio station, WYBC. Laurel was tapped to create an educational program called Your Community Speaks. She brought speakers into New Haven public school classrooms. She recorded their talks and interactions with the school kids, and she put it on the radio. These speakers ranged from Yale professors to storytellers to newspaper editors. This completely new experience set Laurel in new directions. At WYBC, Laurel collaborated with a Yale student named Jill Levitch. Together, they researched and wrote a nonfiction book called Contraband of War. Published in 1970, the book told the story of William Henry Singleton, who was born into slavery and won freedom by serving in the Union Army, then made his way to New Haven. Here, he worked as a coachman, taught himself to read and write, and became a minister in the AME Zion Church. After the radio program debuted, Laura launched Dialogue with Laurel Block. That was her long-running public affairs show on WTNH, Channel 8. Topics were often Jewish, but also ranged from math anxiety to the Connecticut oyster industry. Weekly guests were mostly local, yet some ranged as widely as Hillary Clinton, Art Spiegelman, who wrote the illustrated graphic novel Mouse, and Abba Eben, a statesman and scholar who was instrumental in founding the State of Israel. You will have a chance to sample a few of these interviews later in the program with the help of Paul Falcone at the University of New Haven, who put this together. Block also led the way in establishing the first all-women-owned television station in the country. Channel 43, WBCT, began broadcasting in September 1987. Laurel told the New York Times, I felt it was about time that women achieved parity in communications and were put in positions where they could mold and shape public opinions. Then there were the Holocaust testimonies. In 1979, Block was working on a documentary about the New Haven Holocaust Memorial Eight. <coughs> That's when she contacted Dory Lau, a psychiatrist and child Holocaust survivor. Together, they conducted their initial four survivor interviews in a marathon recording session in Laub's office. At age 52, Block had found her life's work, the Holocaust Survivors Film Project. With an all-volunteer team and no institutional support, Laurel organized interviews around Connecticut and the country. In 1980, she drew upon the initial four interviews to create a documentary for WNEW in New York. It was called Forever Yesterday, and it won a New York Emmy. We will see some clips from that documentary in a few minutes. And as I mentioned before, you can see the Emmy downstairs in the display case. Family pitched in with a video project. Foundations and wealthy individuals provided funding. Video technology, which was then pretty new, made the project feasible because it cost less than film and required less equipment. One of the first interviewees was Renee Hartman, a New Haven librarian and poet who survived the bergen belsen concentration camp as a young child. Her husband, Jeffrey Hartman, was a Yale professor and a different kind of child survivor. 
sent from Germany to England by way of the kinder transport just before the war. He helped make a connection to Yale President Bart Giamatti, asking the university to house the growing collection of videotapes. Giamatti agreed and fast-tracked the acquisition. By the time Yale's Sterling Memorial Library formally received the collection in 1981, it numbered 183 testimonies on roughly 250 videotapes. This is a picture of the signing of, of the documents transferring projects and the people in the picture from left to right are Dory Lau, Jeffrey Hartman, William Rosenberg, Yale University librarian Millicent Abel, and Laurel. This was in 1987. The Redson Foundation provided a startup grant the Foundation President, Eli Evans, spoke movingly at the 1982 inauguration. He said, It is now 37 years since the end of World War II. One only has to sit and watch several hours of this testimony, as I was privileged to do, to imagine what, in another 40 years, what this project can mean to scholars, to young people, to education, to future generations. Forty-plus years have passed since Evan spoke those words. Now, those future generations encompass nearly all of us. Anti-Semitism, indeed, denial of the basic humanity of Jews, has once again flared globally and in the United States. The testimonies that Black and her successors worked so hard to gather stand as an essential reminder the attempted genocide that led to an international agreement to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Laurel Block's visionary efforts to preserve the testimony of those who lived through the Shoah have never mattered more. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you in person to celebrate the remarkable legacy of Laurel this evening, but I thought I'd be remiss to not at least try to make a small contribution to the evening's event. The Fortunoff Video Archive, after all, would simply not exist if it wasn't for Laurel. The creative spark that led her to develop the Holocaust Survivors Film Project, the grassroots organization that would eventually become the Fortunoff Video Archive, is perhaps well documented, but still, in my opinion, insufficiently celebrated. Since becoming director at the Fortune Off Video Archive in 2015, I've made it part of my mission to further elevate Laurel and all the founders of this collection and to honor their contributions. For instance, we've established fellowships in all of the founders' names, including Laurel. The Laurel Block Fellowship was conceived as something that we believed Laurel herself would actually appreciate. A filmmaker in residence fellowship that provides funding to produce short documentary films based on testimonies from the collection. Since we launched the fellowship in 2020, we've produced four films, and there are two other films in production. You can read more about the fellows and the Vlock film series on our website. And while I would, I, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to let Jim Vlock know that this fellowship and our renewed efforts to, to honor Laurel's legacy were underway, I am truly saddened that he could not be here today at this event, which clearly and loudly declares that Laurel has not and will not be forgotten. And while I never had a chance to meet Laurel myself, I would often take a break from Sterling Memorial Library, where our office is located, and visit her at the Grove Street Cemetery. And it was my little way of just saying thank you and letting her know that she was missed. Laurel helped establish this archive to lift up the voices of survivors, to let them speak for themselves. So I'd now like to do the same for her, and to play you a short edited program that lets Laurel indeed speak for herself. I hope it gives you a sense of the remarkable vision, the passion, the determination she brought to this work and to everything else she did in life. Thank you for listening. The, the next uh, video begins with an, uh, the late Jeffrey Hartman, Sterling Professor of English at Yale, introducing Laurel Block at the 1982 inauguration of the Holocaust Video Archive at Yale. 
I turn now to a person without whom the archive could not have come into being. I think most of you know her. She is one of the founders of the Holocaust Survivors Film Project. Laurel Block will now introduce the remainder of her program. This is a very important moment for me. In fact, as you might be able to tell, it's an emotional moment. Before I have make my remarks, I think it's appropriate to introduce the people who are on this platform. Several of them will speak themselves, but others are just our honored guests. So I will begin by introducing, of course, President Jamahi, Mr. Professor Wiesel, Professor John Hersey, the Mayor of New Haven, Biagio Delito, Eli Evans of the Redson Foundation, Dr. Lau, Dr. Dari Lau, Laurie Rutenberg, Mr. Gerald Tarazi, the superintendent of schools, Mr. Hartman, who you know, Mr. William Rosenberg of the Far Bond, and of course, we have the new president of the Federation, Jewish Federation here in New Haven, Mr. William Schuer. I'm not as tall as you, Jeffrey, so I'll lower this microphone a little bit. <clears throat> I said this was a very important moment because it is the opportunity to the potential for a new level of activity for the video archive. From the very inception of the idea, the, the very concept attracted a blend of very talented people. It was an unusual blend of people. It involved a psychiatrist who was a survivor, Dr. Lau, Specifically, it involved a very distinguished professor at Yale University, Professor Hartman. It involved many other people and a very dedicated group of volunteers. I thought it might be useful to have a little history of how it began and why, how we arrived at the point where we are now. As late as 1979, the horror of the event had so numbed those who might have spoken and those who might have listened that there was virtually no interaction. I felt very strongly that personal recollections were very important, that each individual has a story to tell. Each individual who survived that terrible trauma perceived it differently and could relate it uniquely. The video technology had made it possible for us to visually record the, these people. And how a person looks and acts when he says something is a very important com component of the, of the effect that what he or she tells will have. There is also the uh, fact that anyone who has dealt with the cinema verite <coughs> style of filmmaking knows that people soon lose their inhibitions in front of a camera when they are given an open-ended manner of speaking and a warm and caring atmosphere. These things I was sure of. I was sure of the impact of the visual. I was sure of our, the ability to do this kind of interviewing. I was sure that the technology was there to make it possible. What, and I was also sure, very, very frankly, that this was the time 
that it was important to do it now, that it was 40 years after the event and that what time was indeed running out. What I was very uncertain about was reopening old wounds, disturbing personal uh, equilibrium, and that was something that was very dangerous, in my opinion. And I was told about a very, a very important man who has become my colleague and co-founder of the Holocaust Survivors Film Project and now the Video Archive here at Yale, Dr. Laub. And I went to Dr. Laub and I told him of my concerns about this process. And he gave me the reassurance and the support that I needed that this indeed could be done that it could be with the proper support structure, with the proper kind of preparation, that in fact he felt that the survivors, and he is a survivor, themselves were sensing their own mortality and would be willing to come forward at this point. We worked together for several months devising a, a way of approaching this project or this circumstance. And I am very proud to say that the procedures which we developed over those few months from uh, February of 1979 to May 2nd when we did our first taping have in fact stood the test of time because those procedures, although they've been somewhat refined, are exactly the procedures that we are using now. After filming that first evening in his office, his office, which is a psychiatrist's office, has an outer space where we were able to welcome people. We knew that we had to reach out to the wider community, to the survivor community specifically, to get support and strength from them. And we did. And we went to a gentleman on my left, Mr. William Rosenberg, who is uh, the president of an organization that consisted primarily of survivors. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but it is a large number of, uh, of the membership are survivors. And with Mr. William Rosenberg's help, we appealed to the survivor community to endorse us, to help us, to support us. And they did so with their substance as well as their moral support. We always let the taping go on for as long as the person feels he or she wants to talk. And that's very important because people become relaxed and they begin to relate to the interviewer or to the camera as if they were in their own living room talking to someone they know very intimately. It is that kind of presentation that makes the event take on a dimension, gives understanding to the event that perhaps no other technique can bring to it. Decades have passed since the end of the Nazi domination of Europe. Much has been written and spoken about the Holocaust, the attempt in modern times to destroy, systematically, Jews and others considered undesirable or racially impure. In the first years after World War II, the survivors of the concentration camps were reluctant to talk, to relive the shock, the horror, the terror. Now they are older. They fear that future generations may not know or may forget what has happened and will not know the truth. This would be a betrayal of those who suffered and those who died. I'm Laurel Block, co-founder of the Holocaust Survivors Film Project. Our project presents the events of the Holocaust solely through the words of those who live them. Men and women in our own communities, our neighbors, our fellow workers, our friends, our relatives. What you are about to see is more than a documentary. It is an act of courage by survivors who wish their stories to be heard. The real stories without fictional dramatization. What they will recall for us in this next hour is an affirmation of their will to bear witness through memories which will never fade because what happened to them is forever yesterday. My father, who was a veteran of World War I, and 
uh, uh, took the position that uh, this gangster Hitler uh, wouldn't last for long and he would, uh, they would be able to weather the storm that the Hitler regime would just be a passing storm and when the storm would subside and he would be able to live the normal life again to which he was used. Because after all, don't forget that uh, there was Jewish history in Germany which went back approximately a thousand years. And uh, this left uh, uh, something with him. He said he belonged there and uh, nobody else can tell him uh, uh, if he is a German or not a German because uh, he gave whatever he gave to his fatherland. He even came back from, from the first war with decorations. And um, it was his opinion, like it was opinion of many thousands, that, uh, as I said, the regime couldn't last forever for economical reasons and partly political reasons, thinking and hoping that countries like England, France, Czechoslovakia, Poland, surrounding Germany would one day act in order to put an end to that regime. Only later we found out that it was a mistake and then it was too late. They had no, they had no relatives in any foreign country. We went rich and being that my parents were handicapped, that uh, there was no, no way to go any place. You couldn't get a visa for England or? No, who would take us? in our sleeves, but the Germans, they never finished. They always found something coming into the house, looking for furniture, looking for things. It's frightening to watch the coming, taking your own belongings. Do you remember this again? I remember they came one morning, they rang the bell, and they took velvet uh, living room furniture that we had. And I looked at my mother crying. I said, Mother, don't worry. She says to me, slowly our lives are falling apart. I remember in the morning I was waiting for the train to go to the school and uh, the son of the principal was running along yelling, oh, the synagogue is burning, the synagogue is burning. My father at that time wanted to go and uh, you know, when he heard at home, said, the synagogue is burning. My grandparents lived right adjacent to the synagogue since he was in charge of everything, the house connecting to it. So he quickly ran to get my grandparents out and uh, couldn't face the flames. He couldn't go through, so he ran to a neighbor to get a ladder, and the neighbors wouldn't give him a ladder to get them out. Jews began to disappear. And the first um, member of my family to have been shot by the Germans, or perhaps even by the Latvians, was a cousin of mine. He was married to a Latvian girl. And I remember that my father was called on the phone to go and identify his body, which he did. And he came back, I remember he was as white as a sheet, and he said, yes, it was my nephew. That was the first inkling that we had that things are going to be very bad for us. At least as far as I was concerned, was the very first inkling. My parents probably knew much more. He was shot because he was a Jew? Because he was a Jew, and um, I remember the story at that time that he was turned over to the German authorities by his wife, who was Latvian. That was nothing unusual.
didn't know where to turn. He didn't have no one to turn to. Let's say, for example, I had friends on the side out of the ghetto. And I would try to escape. I could escape. I could get out of the ghetto. But where do I go? To whom will I turn to? We didn't have allies. Even my friends, it, I couldn't ask them to keep me. The minute, many, very often it happened that the minute I walked out of the ghetto, a little bit in disguise, I wasn't stopped by an assessment or by a Gestapo man. He wouldn't care in the street who I am or who I am not. But I was stopped by Polish youngsters that were standing hidden in every corner of the street waiting for someone to come out in order to, to um, grab them and to ask um, for money or for whatever you have. So we were fighting not one war, we were fighting a few wars. Especially a moment very touching was that when my father got hold of some money and one day we were sitting around the table and he divided the money. So everyone should have an amount of money just in case we will be separated, which we knew that sooner or later this is going to happen. And my father gave me the largest amount of money. I said to my father, I said, Dad, why do I get the largest amount of money? And he said, look, honey, your mother and I are too old to save ourselves. I was 40, 42 years old. Your brother is much young, but you are the only one that may be able to help yourself. In each building, an underground group of uh, craftsmen would build one place in, a, up in, the, in, a, in the apartment, in a cellar or on the top floor, where there was a hiding place. And okay. this was uniquely built. For instance, if you went into a hiding place, you couldn't see, uh, the, you couldn't see it. Uh, you saw a closet, normal closet. The building was built so that this was irregular. Each apartment was different. From this closet was a unique door that was simulated like a wall to walk in in another place. Experience has shown that you couldn't keep in conspiracy longer than six, seven month, months in a place. I will explain you. If you went out in the middle of the night in an office building, in a place that everybody knew around the, you that this is an office, and you flush the toilet, some neighbors could hear that you flushed the toilet, and right away started out smelling who has flushed the toilet in the middle of the night. My mother was with me in one of these hiding places. In course of being with me, my mother got sick, and of course, if there would be medical help, would be the sickness wouldn't be so serious. But because of the, you could not get a doctor. I got finally a doctor from the underground. The facilities were very meager, and in this horrible uh, situation, my mother passed away. of my parents hearing I would have to be in my parents ears because I could hear the soldiers boots coming up the stairs 
and they had to get, go up four flights of stairs and I could hear them already when they were on the bottom floor. And we lived in a kind of a railroad apartment and I would suddenly rush to my parents and my sister and say we had to go in the back. We had to go to the very back room of the apartment so that they wouldn't hear us. And we would hide there and they would knock on the door and none of us would be allowed to make a peep. And I would constantly keep my finger in front of my mouth to tell them that they were still there. And so they would knock on the door and say, open up, open up. And um, I just told my parents not to listen to anything. And only when I heard the soldiers going up all the way down to the four flights of stairs, did I tell them that they could come out of the room. I wanted to ask you, do you remember the sounds of the Germans when they called for you to come out of the apartment? Do you remember what they said and how they sounded? Yes, it, sound, it, it used to be, I don't really know, know German at all. It's, um, it would, they would say, come out, you Jewish dogs. In German, how did it sound? In German, come raus, ihr Schweinhunde. And sometimes you're like, raus, Juden, raus, Juden. So those things that just stay with you. This is something you don't forget. So you see the trucks, you see the babies, you see screaming mothers, you see um, hanging people. You sit and all of a sudden you see that face there. It's um, something you don't forget, and, and the horror of it is, every time I see the newspaper now, and uh, with Nazis somehow, they, it's just like it never ends, it's no end to it. And this frightens me very much, and I'm not trying to show that the children, I want to scare them, they, they men, already, you know, grown people, and uh, I'm scared what? of something might happen again. I don't know, I'm just scared all the time. We have good veneers. We pretend a lot. Hello, my name is Paul Falcone, and I am the Director of Studio Operations and Media Production at the University of New Haven. Thank you to New Haven Museum and Jewish Historical Society of Greater New Haven for including me in this wonderful event. I'm very sorry I cannot be there in person, but I have a prior event at the University of New Haven that I must attend. I'm honored for the opportunity to talk about my relationship with Laurel and the profound impact she had on the University of New Haven, particularly the Department of Communication, Film, and Media Studies, and the students past and present. It began with a phone call back in the early 1990s when Laurel was looking for a production facility and crew to take her long-running public affairs program, Dialogue with Laurel Vlock. I must confess that at that time, I did not know Laurel and was unfamiliar with her important work and the Holocaust Survivors Film Project. We talked about what she was looking for and if perhaps an arrangement could benefit the production and journalism students in the program. Sitting atop a liberal arts foundation is a hands-on experiential education at UNH, and this fit right in. We agreed to take one program, see how it goes, and take it from there. From there turned out to be eight years and over 100 episodes recorded live on the University of New Haven campus. The program speaks for itself, and I encourage you to visit the Laurel Vlock video archive in the Peterson Library at the University of New Haven. A list of the programs are also available online at newhaven.edu, or please feel free to reach out to me directly. Today's media landscape reminds us of the importance of programs like Dialogue, where shrinking local media makes it more and more difficult to find out what's happening in our own communities. Laurel's commitment to informing people and making a difference through storytelling is alive in every episode of Dialogue with Laurel Vlock. The program had a positive effect in so many communities and on those who watched it, but it also had a profound effect on the students who helped produce it. This is the legacy of Laurel Vlock at the University of New Haven. 
where so many students were privileged to work alongside her during the eight years she was on campus. From the start, Laurel made a commitment to the students. They were not merely crew. Laurel took the time to know each student who was part of the dialogue program. She spent time getting to know their interests and what they hoped for in a media career. In addition to providing advice, she got students thinking in new ways about what working in the media industry could be and how their voice and the stories they tell can make a difference. High aspirations indeed, but the students were seeing it and living it in real time. They had already begun that work. Since then, many of the students that work with Laurel have gone on to successful award-winning careers in journalism, sports broadcasting, entertainment, film, and more. One such student, Antonio McDonald, CEO and founder of Comp Inc., Keep Up and Make Progress, based in New York City, made a visit to campus this past week to discuss with students what it's like being the CEO of a minority-owned business and how what Comp does makes a difference, and they can too. Giving back, Antonio makes frequent visits to UNH and always reminds me how formative it was working with Laurel on the dialogue program. Laurel's legacy is manifested physically at the University of New Haven in the Laurel Block Center for Convergent Media. At the time of its opening in 2007, it was the first classroom of its kind in the state and one of only a few in the country. A forward-looking space to facilitate teaching and learning in a new and rapidly changing media landscape. Today, the classroom remains a state-of-the-art facility where students across the communication curriculum invest in forging their futures. The classroom is a reminder to them and an opportunity for us to continue the work that Laurel found so important and that changed so many for the better. The years I spent working with Laurel are among the most rewarding of my career. The opportunity to help produce meaningful programs with a positive impact while engaging students remains a highlight in 40 years of producing film and television. Laurel was a wonderful human being and I enjoyed very much being in her company and I am privileged and honored to have played a role in her work. I would like to take a moment to thank the Vlock and Brecky families for their support of the University of New Haven and its students. And on behalf of the students in the Department of Communication, Film, and Media Studies, thank you. I hope I have shed some light on the impact Laurel had and continues to have with the dialogue programs and beyond, and how her legacy is alive and well at the University of New Haven. Thank you. You are looking at a picture of the old Broad Street Synagogue, a lost Jewish and New Haven landmark, demolished during the urban renewal of the city, but fortunately preserved pictorially through the work of the New Haven Jewish Historical Society, an organization which is dedicated to capturing and preserving the precious heritage of the New Haven Jewish community. Hello. Welcome to Dialogue, I'm Laurel Vlock, and I'm very pleased to welcome my guests today because the work that they do is for the well-being of the entire New Haven community, and let me introduce them to you. Judith Schiff is the Archives Director of the uh, New Haven Jewish Historical Society, and she's also was the co-founder, so that's a very prestigious uh, title. Next to her is Joel Wasserman, who is currently the president of the society. And Renee Craw is the editor of a series of volumes called Jews in New Haven. And Renee also edits the uh, newsletter that appears, I guess, periodically for the benefit of the members of the organization and perhaps others. Well, you know, a lot of people might ask why all this work uh, for an historical society. There's so much to be done in our present uh, condition, our present community. Why be looking back instead of to now or to the future? Well, I think first of all, we can't help looking back 
the history surrounds us, and especially in a town like New Haven, where we're getting ready to celebrate our 350th anniversary, all of us are very conscious of our roots and want to understand ourselves better by understanding the past. I think we all talk about uh, common phrases that we need history, and over the uh, doorway of the National Archives is the phrase, past is prologue. Uh, uh, people love history, too, even without its academic side. People just love to enjoy the past, to see old pictures and so on. And our society was founded in 1976, but its roots really go way back mm -hmm. uh, to records that were salvaged and saved by our principal founder, Harvey Layden. Well, I, I thought uh, you would tell us uh, about the person who founded it, which... Uh Good health, it's the single most important factor for a happy and productive life. This program is specifically about women's health because there is general consensus that women's health has been largely overlooked and fragmented in terms of medical care and research. Now a special clinic has been established as a joint venture with the Yale New Haven Hospital and the Yale School of Medicine that centralizes diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of women's health problems. It is called Women's Health at Yale, and it is a model of multidisciplinary health care for women. in Jerusalem, Israel. It's called Lifeline for the Old. Lifeline. Mrs. Linda Cantor. Both of these women are very much interested in the project I referred to called Lifeline for the Old. You know, we do a lot of talking in this country about how concerned we are about taking care of our elderly and making sure that life is good at the end as well as at the beginning. But I wonder how much we really do. In Jerusalem, it's different. And that's what I wanted to ask you about, Mrs. Fox. What is Lifeline? How did it begin? <laughs> Well, Lifeline is truly a fantastic story. It's it was founded and is being directed by a most extraordinary woman. Her name is Miriam Mindelau. She's a Sabra. She's a former teacher of some 25 years' experience, and it has been and is now devoting all of her time to the care of the old, the sick, and the incapacitated. Her philosophy is that being old doesn't necessarily signal the end of uh, life. Uh, since life is defined by what you do, she contends that old people must do something to preserve their sense of dignity and uh, sense of well-being as a human being. Her credo, in other words, is to be is to do. In simple terms, it's, it only means that if you're alive, you're breathing, you can do something either physically or mentally. And I quite go agree with that. Well, it wasn't easy. Now, she contends that no one is too sick or too old to do something. Well, I submit that that's a highly debatable statement. And, you know, even the term, I love it, lifeline, you're reaching out. Why don't we have them here? Lifeline, at this point, is a pilot project. I only know of one place in the world, and it rests on the shoulders of Miriam Mendelo, a group of volunteers which she has inspired and now what would relate perhaps to our cottage industries, teachers who could teach quality crafts and then have saleable objects. Miriam Mendela was a teacher and she would say, why teach reading and writing when I can teach human value? So her purpose in this thinking is to bring children up with the right human values 
And we're talking not about crafts and shops and pay and work. We're talking about the next generation and how they view the elderly. This is what's so unique about Lifeline. But I guess the, the question that bothers me very much is that you have this prototype. It's there in Jerusalem. <laughs> I think the, uh, the woman behind the camera was saying to us before we went on the air that there are some wonderful television programs now which reflect the fact that there's a lot of concern in this country about the quality of life, life for older people. But sitting at home and watching television shows is no substitute for the kind of thing that you just described. And so why isn't some of the energy being diverted to creating circumstances where they're actively doing, not just hearing about? The closest we've come in this country, to my knowledge, is the sheltered workshop. There have been sheltered workshops around the country, always government funded and therefore uh, subsidized by our government. When the subsidy is removed, the, the project seem to fold. Uh, I think it's an attitudinal one of our generation. They don't think of elderly as people to whom you pay money. They think of elderly as volunteers, as people to keep occupied, and many times they think of them as childish. Have you ever gone someplace with an older person? For instance, you might come into a doctor's office and they'll say to your mother, as I've taken a mother in, they'll say, uh, my mother will walk up and ask herself, and then they turn to me and say, what is her name and what is her address? Mm -hmm. As if she wasn't there. Likewise, in terms of employment, we're not thinking of the elderly as employable and as their time being worth money. This is what I want to see happen in this country. What are some of the major challenges facing America as we enter the 21st century? Keeping our cities viable for one, re-establishing urban neighborhoods and providing secure and healthy places for elderly, giving children a positive environment to live, to learn, and to acquire the skills necessary for their future. In a moment, we shall hear about an innovative, functional center which is meeting needs and addressing some of those challenges in the inner city of New Haven. It is called Casa Linda. This is Dialogue, and I'm Laurel Block, and I have two exceptionally civic-spirited people with me today. They are Linda Cantor and Alicia Caraballo, and welcome to Dialogue. Welcome to the program. Let me tell the viewers a little bit first about uh, what we're going to be discussing. Casa Linda is the activity center for a large residential community for low-income elderly Latinos in New Haven. The residential center is called Casa Ochinal, which means autumn house in Spanish. The word Linda means beautiful in Spanish, and Casa Linda was so named with affection and admiration by the residents of Casa Ochinal, who observed my guest, Linda Cantor, as a volunteer and as a member of the board of Casa Ochinal, conceived a plan, and they watched as daily she was supervising workmen renovating some abandoned buildings across the street in order to provide workshops and an activity center for the Casa Ochenial residents. So in addition to Casa Linda becoming a place to go and be productive for seniors, it attracted the children of the neighborhood, and it has truly become a center for activities for the old and the young, and it's a place to share skills and be safe and happy. And that circumstance is of great interest to Alicia Caraballo, who has volunteered her time and energies as president of the board of Casa Ochenial, and she is also the principal of a very large elementary school in New Haven, so Mrs. Caraballo has a very special interest in the well-being of children.
program is called Jewish Spectrum. It is a program of news and analysis, reports and features of special interest to the Jewish world. Hello and welcome to Jewish Spectrum. I'm Laurel Block. After this Tuesday's elections, my guest may very well be the First Lady of the United States. We'll be back after these messages with Mrs. Hillary Clinton. Mrs. Clinton, it's really an honor to have you here. I'm delighted with the opportunity. You've been campaigning nonstop, crisscrossing the country. What have you learned? Oh, I've learned so many things about our country, but I've mostly learned about the brave and courageous people who are fighting against incredible odds all over America to try to make life better for themselves, their families, and their communities. Hello, welcome to Jewish Spectrum. I'm Laurel Block. Our book is The Fifth Son, published by Summit Books. The author is often called the poet laureate of the Holocaust, perhaps more appropriately, the philosopher and poet of the Holocaust. He is, of course, Elie Wiesel. Welcome, Professor Wiesel. I'd like to introduce Marion Fox Wexler, who is Laurel Block's sister. Hi, and I see from this turnout that Laurel will always have a following. And that makes me feel very sentimental and very happy at the same time. I'm grateful to the New Haven Museum, the Judith Ann Schiff Program of the Jewish Historical Society, for choosing to honor the contributions of my unique and wonderful sister, Laurel Block even though now remembering her this way makes me miss her more than I already do. I was asked to talk about her early years, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> Laurel would have been 98 now, and I was just four years behind her. Laurel was born August 5th, 1926, here in New Haven, to a Jewish couple, Rose and John Fox, two very intelligent and educated people. Her mother graduated from teacher's college and taught for several years, and her father was a graduate of Cornell University as a civil engineer. Laurel was the best big sister a kid sister could have. I loved her so much, and she loved me back, as well as being very protective of me. For instance, she heard another child trying to tell me where babies came from, and she promptly whisked me away, knowing that it wasn't the kind of news that a six-year-old girl needed to have. <laughs> She also protected me from two bullies from St. Brendan's Church who called me a Christ killer. I didn't even know who Christ was. <laughs> Laurel was both a serious, sweet-looking, graceful young girl and an accomplished tap dancer as well. She had light brown curly hair and large Betty Davis eyes. Unfortunately, those eyes didn't do what they were supposed to do. She was profoundly nearsighted, which troubled her all her life. Only her enormous determination and fortitude helped her to accomplish the myriad of things that she did accomplish despite them. In those days, boys didn't make passes at girls that wear glasses, and the kind of glasses Laurel would have had to wear would have had very thick lenses, and that would not have been very attractive. So consequently, she never wore them. Later on in her life, contact lenses, lenses <coughs> became popular, and she was quick to inquire them. Back then, they were not the small discs that only covered the cornea of the eye. They were made of a hard substance and covered the entire eye. But <laughs> I never understood how she was able to stand them. But what she wanted to do, she did, so indicative of her character. She was very studious and did very well in school and was popular with both girls and boys. We grew up in a home where being part of the Jewish community was a given. My mother and father observed the Sabbath. My mother always lit the candles on Friday night, and my father made a kiddush, followed by their attendance at synagogue. Rose's family was very religious, and her father was one of the founders of the B'nai Jacob Synagogue here in New Haven. Consequently, my mother and father were very involved in synagogue life. Our mother was president of the B'nai Jacob Sisterhood, and later on, my father was president of that synagogue on two separate occasions. He was also president of the New England chapter of the Zionist Organization of America and chairman of the Israeli Bonds Drive. 
They were also instrumental in founding Camp Laurelwood, meant for underprivileged Jewish children. But it became so popular that many people who were not deprived sent their children there, including me. In fact, sitting here today in the audience is Dr. Erwin Braverman, who was a camp doctor for eight years. <laughs> As children, we were also expected to contribute. Rose made wonderful string marionette puppets, and Laurel and I, as the Laurel and Marionettes, gave performances for kids for which we charged 10 cents per show. The money was raised and we went to charity. Our mother and father talked openly about world affairs. They didn't try to protect Laurel and me from the news and from their concerns about an impending war in Europe. But the event that had the biggest impact on us was a trip we took on the Queen Mary in the summer of 1937 to visit relatives in England and to see important cultural sites on the continent, including our tour in Holland, Belgium, France, and Luxembourg. Work we <coughs> Rose was an amazing example of an independent woman. She managed all the logistics herself. No doubt she influenced Laurel and me that a woman could do it all. During that time in Europe, as young as we were, we knew about Hitler and saw the way he was revered in Germany and that anti-Semitism was already over us. One time, a woman who became friends with my mother asked to take us up to get some ice cream, Laurel and me. When she was with her, when she was with us, she stopped in front of a window that had a picture of Hitler, and she talked about how much she admired them. During the visit, she asked what our religion was, and we said we were Catholic, because we were afraid if she knew we were Jewish, she wouldn't bring us back to our mother. Terrible to think that kids could think that way back then. Rose and John did all they could to raise money to help European Jews once the war began. Again, they were not to stand by. Laurel was a member of a sorority at Hill House High School, and they had raised money for a dance. Well, Rose talked to the sorority members and persuaded them to donate that money for the dance to a charity. Many of the mothers were very upset that my mother had done that. We were very aware of the state of the Jews in Europe, and Rose and John were ardent Zionists. Rose's father fled Russia to escape Jewish persecution there. Anti-Semitism and where it could lead was part of the family history. Others can discuss Laura's career as a filmmaker, but I would like to say how her personality and character as a quiet, thoughtful, and sensitive person allowed her to conduct the most emotionally difficult interviews. I assisted her with some of those interviews and saw admiringly what she did was able to do in only her own insightful way. It's like this, but I'd like to turn the program over to Laurel's son, Danny Block. I've been asked to say a few words about her, not from the perspective of her accomplishments, but for how we as a family thought of her. You know, I must say that reading the bio that Carol Bass drafted really brought home just how much she accomplished and the impact that she had. But growing up with her, I'm not sure we fully appreciated just how remarkable it was. It was to us, her children, that was what my mom was doing. That was normal. She was basically our mom doing her weekly routine of a television program or a documentary. And so this event has made me think about what it was about my mother that motivated and allowed her to pursue and achieve such a remarkable number of achievements. Now, on a more personal note, and I'm grateful for this, this event has allowed me to, if you will, spend time with my mom, uh, someone that we lost over 20 years ago. And just for that alone, I'm very grateful. Let me start with this photo. 
In 1960, my family host, Kyle wrote, the offensive captain of the New York Giants at our home. <laughs> what you can see there is my brother Michael, my cousin Andrew Wexler, and then me at eight years old, uh, looking on as my mother served Kyle wrote dinner. Um, from our family's perspective, what was the most memorable, memori uh, memorable part of the event was when my then four-year-old sister Sandy launched a football that Kyle wrote and hit him in the eye. <laughs> and I think that may have contributed to the Giants losing season that year. <laughs> but what's significant about this photo is that I think it marks the transition from my mother, from a stay-at-home mom, to only a few years later. This. And so that's really quite a transition, and I'd like to share with you my thoughts of how and why that happened. And I think it can be distilled into three categories. Where she came from, who helped influence her, and what was special about her. So these are my grandparents, Rose and John Fox, Laurel and Marion's parents. They lived next door to us in Woodbridge. John was a great Toastmaster, and he was always making speeches for a number of events. And I want to read to you the advice he gave us on his 80th birthday. And he said, as I was nearing this, this is his 80th birthday, I became aware of some of its benefits. You enjoy a kind of admiration from everyone, not for any talent or worldly success or spiritual superiority, oh no, but for your astonishing survival. <laughs> no one refers to you as old when they learn your age. They invariably say, you look wonderful. You don't look it, but what they really would like to know is how do you do it? Well, let me tell you my secret. If you want to feel and look as young as I do at 80, get involved with community causes, give to the UJA, buy Israel bonds, support the Hebrew University, Hadassah, Boys Town, Weizmann Institute, Jewish National Fund, your own school and college, your local synagogue, Jewish Community Center, your local hospital, United Way, the Home for the Elderly, and on and on and on. These are things that you can do for, according to the prophet Jeremiah, community activity is as meritorious as studying the Torah. There's one other prerequisite, and that's my second point to ensure we reach the age of 80. Marry a nice Jewish girl like I did. <laughs> so after 51 years, five months, and one day, I am still in love with Rosie. Aww. This is, Rose and John built their lives around community. Um, and this is an example that they set, and as John said, this was the secret for a long, fulfilling life. And under the photos that you can see of them, it is a partial list of what they were involved with and the positions that they held. So as you can see, this was a significant commitment that went beyond just joining a couple of organizations. And as Marion mentioned, Rose and John were instrumental in establishing Camp Laurelwood in Madison, Connecticut. Rose helped identify the site for the camp and started a camp scholarship foundation to allow inner city children to attend. John not only served as president of the camp, but according to the camp history, personally repaired the earthen dam that created the lake that was used by the campers. Rose told us that the name of the camp came from the laurel bushes that were found on the property. I continue to believe it was named after my mother. <laughs> my bias. I want to spend a few more moments on Rose. Rose was a force of nature, both literally and figuratively. This is her at 85 years old when she was still climbing trees. <laughs> okay? Beyond her community involvement, she was a constant part of our lives, teaching us to ride a bicycle, knitting our winter hats and mittens, and always working in her garden. The mittens, I should add, were attached to her coats through, I think you can see it here, a long string, okay, so we wouldn't lose them. And that's a photo of my brother wearing those, and what it meant is that we could never fully extend our arms, so we were always kind of like going like this back and forth as we were doing it. And as you heard, Rose was the first woman in New Haven to get a driver's license. I wish that meant that she was the best driver, but she was the first. <laughs> she and my grandmother had a wonderful 62-year marriage. And on her 100th birthday, we asked her what she thought was the secret of a successful marriage. She thought for a minute and then replied with advice none of us were expecting. She said, never give your husband bad news until it becomes obvious. <laughs> So, as 
I mentioned, my grandmother was a force. She was never shy about expressing her opinion, especially about issues she was passionate about. If Rose thought something was important, nothing stopped her from pursuing it. And so watching the rise of fashion in the 1930s and speaking with one of her brothers, Rose became convinced that Europe was about to go up in flames. So she decided it was important for her two daughters to see Europe before it happened. And that's why, as you've heard, in 1937, she did something extraordinary. Rose and then 10-year-old Laurel and 7-year-old Marion boarded the Queen Mary for Europe. And after a week at sea, they spent the next six weeks traveling through Europe. And it was, as you've heard, a transformative experience. These are some photos uh, of Laurel and Marion at a dance on board the Queen Mary and also a dinner there. And below are some photos of them in London and Paris. Marion, you look wonderful with the berets on. Uh, and in Holland, Brussels, and Luxembourg. And in, in, in England, they visit Rose's older sister and tour the sites of London and Brighton. But this wasn't just simply a tour. Rose used this as a teaching experience and to point out the dangers of fascism and anti-Semitism, as you've heard. So while they visited Buckingham Palace, they also saw the anti-Semitic uh, graffiti inspired by Oswald Mosley, the founder and leader of the UK's pro-Nazi party, the British Union of Fascists. My grandmother was not the best photographer, but I wanted to share with you this last blurry, blurry fish picture over here. And this was taken in Remisch Luxembourg, and that's where they got a disturbing glimpse of the rise of Nazism. In Remisch, they were able to walk across the bridge spanning the Moselle River and then to Germany without a visa. There they encountered German children who stopped playing and gave them the Nazi salute. According to Marin, it was a warm day, and they stopped for a soda at a small cafe. Hanging on the wall of the cafe was a picture of Adolf Hitler. Now, although she was only seven years old, Marion knew from Rose this was a bad man. And so she did what I guess she thought was the right thing. She stuck her tongue out at the picture of Hitler. <laughs> Rose grabbed Marion and Emma, and the three of them left, quickly left the cafe and crossed the bridge back into Luxembourg. When the war ended, Rose and, John, uh, Star and Rose and John did all they could to warn people about the persecution of Jews in Germany. Many would not believe them. And after the war, it was more shocking to get that the same Oswald Mosley was now leading a movement to deny that the Holocaust had ever happened and to claim that the bodies burned in gas chambers were due to a typhus outbreaks and not a means of extermination. And it's not surprising that Rose would have been so concerned and vocal about this and the rise of anti-Semitism. Her family had seen it before. This is Rose's father, Jacob Greenberg. Jacob and his wife, Rebecca, lived in Okachiv, a small town east of Odessa, that was in, in what was then Russia, where they had a lumber business. In 1887, he and his oldest son, Sam, slipped out of Okachiv in the middle of the night, leaving his wife and six children behind. They weren't alone. Five years early in 1882, the May Laws were enacted in Russia. Those laws were a series of repressive and discriminatory measures aimed at Jews who were blamed for the assassination of Tsar Nicholas II. Beyond the legal restrictions, the assassination led to a series of pogroms where thousands of Jews were killed, and as a result, more than two million Jews left Russia over the next 30 years. What you're seeing here is a copy of Jacob's naturalization papers from 1898. And what I find interesting on this is that it says he was born in Turkey. <laughs> That's not true. He was born in Kherson, a port city by the Black Sea, which is now Ukraine, and that city is unfortunately in the news a lot recently because of the invasion by Russia. I believe that the reason that Jacob lied about where he was born, because at the time, the Ottoman Empire was restricting the entry of people, especially Jews, seeking to flee Russia. Most likely, the only way that Jacob was able to leave Russia was, if you will, as an illegal immigrant, with forged documents claiming he was a citizen of the Ottoman Empire. It seems he continued to use those forged documents when he applied for U.S. citizenship. Jacob and his son spent the next year traveling the world looking for a place to live. They even went to Argentina, where Baron de Hirsch had established a colony for Jews. <coughs> According to my grandmother, it was a frontier-type town that her father could not adjust to, so he decided to come to America. While in New York, he heard from a friend who had a grocery store in New Haven. He bought a partnership in that store in 1888, 
at which point he was able to send for the rest of his family. The grocery store was at the corner of George and Bay Streets, which according to my grandmother was, at the time, practically on the edge of town. Rose told us how their Irish Catholic neighbors objected to her father having the store closed on Saturday, but open on Sunday. Rose felt that her father's insistence on adhering to his beliefs was instrumental in having the neighborhood accept and eventually admire and befriend her family. Rose didn't have to see Russia. She was born in 1898 in New Haven. And as you can see from the birth certificate, her mother was 42 at the time, and this was her 15th pregnancy and her last one. That's a picture of Rose with eight of her brothers and sister. Sister, I can't help but think that my mother's family history, combined with her parents' strong commitment to community involvement, is what planted the seeds for what motivated my mother to become a voice for her community. The shock of what they saw and experienced in Europe, not only with the rise in Nazism, but a generation earlier, by Rose's parents, could not help have influenced the path that, they, that my mother would follow. Beyond my mother's family, I also think that her contemporaries had a major influence. While growing up, I don't think I appreciated how remarkable many of the women were who my, were my parents' friends and relatives. Thinking back, and I'm, I know this is an incomplete list, there was Marjorie Lerner, a professor of dermatology at Yale. Sonia Goldstein, a professor in the law school. Ruth Grobstein, who became later chair of radiation therapy at Scripps. Shirley Schaefer, a radio personality. And Gloria Schaefer, secretary of the state of Connecticut. And then, of course, there was my father's <coughs> sister, Bobby, who, along with her husband, founded and still runs a highly successful company. I also want to out highlight a very special relationship. This is my parents with Fred and Linda Cantor. For close to 60 years since I was 13, our families have been intertwined, and they were and are our closest family friends. But beyond that, my father and Linda were instrumental in establishing Tower One, Casa Ultanao, and as you heard, Casa Linda. And working together, they were able to obtain federal funding for New Haven's first low-cost elderly housing. Tower One became a model, a national model, for quality, non-profit, affordable senior housing. And in doing so, they reinvented how elderly housing was envisioned and developed in New Haven and the rest of the country. That achievement was recognized by the U.S. Senate in 1975, when they were invited to testify and were in front of the Subcommittee on Appropriations and the Importance of Quality Housing for the Elderly. And as you can see there in the lower right, that's my mom interviewing my father and Linda about this. <laughs> Taken as a whole, I think that my mother was surrounded by individuals, especially women, who set examples about how one could provide a, make a significant contribution to their profession and community. And I have to think this created an environment that, only, that encouraged and even motivated my mother to pursue her television and documentary film career. Then, of course, there was my mother's most, most important relationship, and that was with her husband, my father, Jim Vlock. My parents went to Cornell during World War II. I'm convinced it was fate that brought them together. My father had planned to attend Harvard, but at the last minute he switched to Cornell. That was because Cornell offered him a scholarship that reduced tuition from $600 a year at Harvard to only $100 a year at Cornell. <laughs> Within a month of arriving, they met not in class, but at a dance at Barton Hall, the Cornell Armory that held over 4,000 people. As I heard the story, my father actually cut in on my mother's date. They became a Cornell couple and were together for 52 years. Actually, it was more than fate. It was a miracle. On the left is a photo of Marion Laurel, and Laurel was 11 years old. And if you look closely, and you can see that in the middle here, that if you can see the glasses that she was wearing. Ma Mom's eyes were terrible, and the glasses looked like the bottoms of Coke bottles. And as she got older and became self-conscious, she refused to be seen wearing her glasses and literally spent her time walking around with everything in a blur. That only changed when she began using contact lenses as they became available in the 1950s. How she was able to even find or, for that matter, see my father was nothing short of <laughs> <laughs> a miracle. 
And I know it was significant because when I went off to college, my mother turned to me and she said she knew I was going to have a far better experience than she had going to college. And I looked at her and I said, Mom, how's that possible? You met your husband within a month of arriving there and you had a wonderful experience. And she told me, yeah, that's true, but you'll be able to see. <laughs> In any case, fate. Miracle or whatever, the marriage was highly, a highly successful partnership. My father provided my mother with the structure, support, and above all, the encouragement that permitted her to pursue her various activities. I also think it created a synergy in that my mother's success in radio and television motivated my father to pursue his work with Tower One and vice versa. <laughs> this is one of my favorite photographs of my mom. I took this photo when she had returned after being taken on a motorcycle ride over some twisty mountain roads by a close family friend. It's one of my favorites because I think it captures one of her greatest traits, her enthusiasm. Laurel was interested and excited by just about everything. And I, I want to give you a story that tries to describe, at least to me, for us as a family, what I believe why it was so important and motivating. When I was 18, we took a family trip through Spain and Portugal. And beyond visiting Sevilla, Cordoba, and other cities, my mother wanted to make it a fully immersive experience. The year before, James Nister had published his travel book on Spain, Iberia. Laurel decided that she would read out loud to us from Nister's 900-page book <laughs> as we drove through southern Spain. Her reading unfortunately, was constantly interrupted because she got so excited by what she was seeing. For someone whose profession depended on the use of the spoken word, when she got too excited, words would fail her, fail her, and all she could do was wave her arms around, point, and it was a phrase that we as a family always loved. She would go, look, look, see, see. <laughs> and so that's how we traveled. A few paragraphs of Iberia, punctuated by look, look, see, see around every turn in the road. And that's what has set us off on an eight-hour detour. Mishnah wrote that if you really wanted to understand the Spanish psyche you had and what motivated them to explore the new world, you had to visit Badajoz. Badajoz is a city on the Portuguese border about 150 miles from Sevilla. It was a major trek, but my mother was convinced that it was going to be a revelatory experience that would truly allow us to understand the soul of Spain. And so off we went with my mother reading Mishnah between look, look, see, see pronouncements. Well, if you're wondering if we had a regular revelatory experience, well, here's how the travel books describe Badajoz. It's a scruffy, sprawling, industrial city with hardly the prettiest or the most interesting. So after spending four hours to get there, we spent 15 minutes driving through now before moving on. So why am I telling you that story? It's certainly not to encourage a visit to Badajoz. What it illustrated to me was my mother's approach to life and the opportunity she pursued. To my mother, everything and everybody offered the promise of being interesting and exciting. She never turned down a chance to see or do something. It meant that she literally couldn't pass up an opportunity to pursue something new even when, even if she lacked the experience or expertise, missing out was far worse than not trying at all. And that's what allowed her, without prior experience, to make the leap into radio, into television, documentary filmmaking, and even starting her own TV station. So even if, like Badajoz, it didn't work out, it was far better to take that chance, make that leap, and not miss an opportunity. And so it imparted to me a lesson I still carry. Don't miss out on anything because you never know where that opportunity, that person, event, or experience might lead. I think that my mother's belief that there was something of interest and not to be missing everything and everybody was one of her greatest qualities. It meant that everything that she did carried the promise of a new discovery or a new experience. It served her well in her career in broadcasting and documentary filmmaking, and it made her a great interviewer. She made everyone she spoke to feel as if what they had to say was important and special, not as a manipulation, but because she truly believed that was the case. 
So today's event focuses on my mother's most significant achievement, the Holocaust Survivors Project. From my perspective, that achievement was an outgrowth of her family's history and commitment to community, along with the support and encouragement that her family and friends provided, both of which were combined with her inexhaustible enthusiasm and curiosity. And so, when it became technically feasible for videotape, to videotape people in their homes, she was open and ready to explore how that could be used to bear witness. There's a famous quote by Louis Pasteur who said, fortune favors the prepared mind. I'd modify that slightly for my mother to say, fortune favors the enthusiastic and open mind. <coughs> or as my mother would say, look, look, see, see. <laughs> and it was that trait that made it special to her family and I believe motivated her to pursue a remarkable career. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for our speakers? Anybody have any memories of Laurel that they may want to share? Probably everybody. Probably. <laughs> 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 um, all right. Well, um, if there is someone who'd like to share, otherwise we will move downstairs and you can all share your, your stories. And um, just, again, wonderful program. Thank you all for coming. Tonight.